All right, so today we're talking about the power of grassroots. In short, today you're gonna to learn different things related to building and utilizing voter lists, how to engage and utilize your volunteers, uh, communicating with voters, how to conduct grassroots activity, and how to plan grassroots events. So the first portion of that is list building. So what kind of lists are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about direct mail lists, email lists, volunteer lists, donor lists, absentee voter lists, and super voter lists. The most important of these for any grassroots campaign is your absentee voter, super voter, and your general voter lists. Uh, the others are highly recommended if you uh, are pursuing email, direct mail uh, campaign strategies, or if you have enough volunteers and donors to where you want to keep them organized using uh, lists. So how do you build a winning list? Well, first you're going to do some political mapping. You're going to identify the people and organizations that matter in the race for school board, for city council, or for whatever uh, state board of education seat you're running for. And to start for some of those lists like your donor and your volunteer, go through your email, your business cards that you have, friends and family. Uh, and for other lists, going towards direct mail, uh, email lists, uh, voter lists, you're going to find the best data available to you, most likely through whoever is in charge of your election, whether that's your county supervisor of elections, whether you go through the county clerk, uh, those individuals will have voter lists available uh, for you with information regarding uh, the address, uh, phone information, name, and Depending on the state, sometimes you'll get other information like age, uh, the number of times they voted, uh, which elections they voted in uh, as a part of those lists. The most important thing to remember about building voter lists is that you're using the voter list to target your efforts. Target the voters who are going to vote, not the people who never vote. And you wanna target this in a way that works from your anticipated base outwards. For example, uh, when I was on the Yunkin campaign, the first houses we were knocking, the first lists that they sent us were early vote Republican hard voters. So you're gonna go through a list, you're gonna find you know, people very likely to vote, people who likely vote, for pro-parent candidates, whether that's because they're Republican or whether they have, if you're getting this list from the county party, if they have a certain uh, voter score attached to them. Uh, but the principle is the same. Look for people who are the most likely to vote, especially if they're likely to vote absentee or early and remind them that you are running, that you uh, want to earn their vote and then work outwards from there. As you get closer to election day, uh, you'll probably want to sink back into uh, get out the vote efforts. But some more information on voter lists. Uh, these lists will provide you with the opportunity to target voters. Uh, they can be found, like I said, at the county election supervisor or clerk's office. Um, each state has different rules about what is included and who can access the lists and information uh, will be included in the library. Uh, we want to organize these contacts into a spreadsheet and kind of the process I was talking about before, you're going to identify your high propensity voters. Um, and depending on the race you're in, you can divide voters based on party. Um, in this election for our school board members, I think having a Republican list could be of great benefit to you. Uh, you will want to talk to the local uh, Republican party and see if they're willing to share that information. Uh, but if you are able to get your hands on information that includes party identification, 
Uh, in general, I think the pro-parent message spreads beyond Republican-based politics, but it is going to be highly resonant with base Republicans, and they will turn out to vote if they are given enough touches. All right, so continuing on, uh, this list should be used and tracked for all voter contacts, uh, which is mail, phone, text, door, et cetera. Uh, generally, the rule of thumb is you've earned someone's vote if you have one spoken to them and they have said they will vote for you, and if you've touched them seven times. Touches include mail, phone, text, door knocking. Um, so you want to be in contact seven times. Obviously, you're not going to be able to contact every potential voter seven times, especially if you're running a smaller race. But maximizing the number of times you reach out to high propensity voters who you know will support you will be very important to winning in these small local races. Um, things you should be able to track on your list, the date of each contact, whether or not they responded to each contact, and who contacted them each time. This allows you not only to plan multiple contacts, but it allows you to spread your resources out efficiently. You know, if you've already reached them twice by door, the utility of sending someone a third time, you know, if it's not a final get out the vote effort is limited. This is an indication that you should try text, phone, or mail. Of course, and we'll go over this later, each one of those is effective slightly differently and more important or less important depending on the time uh, or the space we're at in the election cycle. Um, if your budget allows, look into purchasing a data subscription. Uh, comes with a walkbook app, including a phone bank system, and they will have all the data you need. Uh, or if you think your data is better, you can input your data into these apps manually. And if anyone is interested, uh, I believe I'll also talk about it later in the presentation, what some of these uh, data apps are and what they look like. All right, and moving right along, uh, once you have the voter lists, you have your data and you know who you're gonna reach out to. Well, it would be great if you could do all of the outreach yourself, if you could send every text, every email, every mail piece and knock on every door. But of course we know that's not possible. And that's where volunteers come into the mix. And please, I will monitor the chat. Let me know if I'm going too quickly uh, and if you want me to slow down, but we should have plenty of time left for questions at the end. So volunteers, what do they do? They're the heart of any local campaign. I mean, they're the heart of any campaign, but they're especially important in smaller races where you're not going to have, you know, tens or dozens or hundreds of employees working for you. Uh, one, they go into neighborhoods that you can't, either because it's a gated community, uh, maybe it is a community where you have already knocked and it would not be fruitful for you to go twice to that area in one week, five weeks out from the election date. Um, and they also help set up events. They can work your campaign functions, et cetera. Uh, but my favorite thing about volunteers, which is something I learned over many campaigns, is that volunteers are networkers. Uh, if someone volunteers for you, I can say this with almost 100% certainty, they will tell their friends to vote for you. They will tell their family to vote for you because no one who is out there putting in the time to help your campaign get across the finish line uh, wants to... <laughs> They don't want to lose. So they're going to encourage their friends and family to vote for you. Uh, and I think having a good network of volunteers, people to show up to your events, people to help you at the table, they do a lot as a side uh, benefit to lend credibility to your campaign. You know, if you're not the only person at the county fair or at the churchyard or at the, you know, the park with a t-shirt on for your campaign, uh, it definitely makes people look a little more and say, oh, there's some real energy behind this candidate, behind this movement. I want to see 
more of what they have to offer. So when you're starting to recruit for volunteers, the easiest place to begin is with what I call your go-to volunteers. You'll find these roughly one of two ways. One, they're gonna be the members of like-minded groups. These are gonna be your active volunteers for local political organizations and clubs. These could be people who are part of the best coalition in your area. Uh, these are the leaders of local parent groups and their uh, active members. Uh, if you are in a college town or if you are in an area where there are a lot of young people or college aged people, uh, I think that college and uh, young adults are a great way to get volunteers. Obviously for this, for all volunteers, but for this group especially, Service hours, internships, and free pizza goes a long way in recruiting those individuals to help with your race. And the second bucket should be one that's obvious, your friends and your family. You know, do not ever be afraid to make the ask to a friend or a family member, obviously given that they are in a position to be able to volunteer for you but make the ask and see if they'll bring other volunteers to come along. Because I can tell you right now, it will be very difficult for you to win if you do not have any volunteers, anyone helping out with your campaign. You know, even the smallest races are not a one man show. So never be afraid to make the ask to those who love you the most. Uh, I can promise that most of them desperately want to see you win your race. So now you have your group of volunteers. Do you want a bunch of volunteers who just come out once, have a decent time, go home and you never hear from them again? I can't see the chat. Uh, feel free to let me know if that's what you're interested in, but I assume you're not. So when we're retaining volunteers, uh, one of the first, and I think one of the biggest pieces of information is you can make volunteer events fun. Uh, offer food, light refreshments, incentivize competition with some light prizes, you know, $10 gift card to Starbucks, or if you hate Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts or Tim Hortons. Um, yeah, a free campaign hat. Um, all of these different things that you can do to incentivize competition will make bring a little bit of light and a little bit of fun to your events. Um, following up with volunteers after they have attended an event is key to retention. The easiest way to do this, and one thing that you should never forget, is to thank all of your volunteers for their participation. That could come from you, or if you have a campaign manager, your campaign manager, but in these local races, uh, there should not be so many volunteers that it's burdensome uh, to send a thank you email or a note or a letter after they participate. Um, volunteers aren't employees, they're not staff. So the appreciation for them putting out their time to help your campaign does go a long way in uh, telling them that they're valuable, that you uh, enjoyed your time with them and that they're an asset to your campaign and you want them to come back. Um, I mentioned this before, college youth groups are great for recruiting volunteers. If you offer internships, uh, that is a key way to retain, but I understand not everyone lives in a college town. Just going even further into making volunteering fun, uh, parties or events based around your volunteers is a great way to liven up uh, the atmosphere. You can think of things like a call or text party. Uh, I know sign making parties, volunteers love to make signs and we'll talk more about signs later, but if you throw them a bone and do a big sign making event with them, uh, themed volunteer nights, uh, for example, on the Yonke campaign, we did ladies nights. Um, phone banking for all women volunteers, have the office, we have the offices decorated, uh, we made snacks. 
And we would bring in, you know, a female Republican executive committee chairwoman or, you know, a high up on the campaign who was a woman. Um, you could call it mom night uh, for your school board races, you know, because the mama bears are uh, invested in the uh, pro parent fight for education. Um, and another thing you can do is, you know, if we're talking more about a door knocking or a phone banking day, not something where you're all going to be staying in one place necessarily. See if there's a way that you can meet up at a restaurant before or after volunteering. You know, nothing fancy. I would not recommend going to the steakhouse, but meet up, uh, maybe cover the tab or just give them the space to have those conversations, network um, to kind of make it more of a social experience. And that will increase um, the volunteers' willingness to come back and it will, you know, give them ties to the campaign if they make friends, say, with your staff or your volunteers um, or yourself even. All right. So now that you've created the list, you know who you're reaching out to, you have the volunteers to help you with the outreach. What does that look like? You know, you're going to talk to voters. You know, how do you start the conversation? How do you end the conversation? All right, so some of the main ways uh, you will see campaign outreach is through events, media, yard signs, and door to door. Um, I will take a second and open up the chat. I want you to let me know which one of these uh, campaign activities do you think is the most important for uh, a grassroots campaign? All right, someone said door knocking. Any other guesses? All right, I see we've gotten some answers. Yeah, uh, the majority of you, uh, in my opinion, and the data are 100% right. Door to door campaigning is the most important individual aspect of your campaign. I saw someone said yard signs. Yard signs are a great way to get your name out there. They are certainly going to be a part of every campaign of every size. I think uh, my friend, uh, Dina Evanshed says it best. Uh, you cannot win with yard signs alone or with yard signs as your main campaign strategy, but it is very difficult to win without them. However, if you do not knock a single door the entire time of your campaign, you will not win. You will not earn those voters. Uh, real quick, uh, Joseph asked for suggestions for placement. Um, maximum visibility. Uh, I imagine you're gonna have a limited number of signs. Uh, if you have property owners who are uh, friendly with your campaign, who live on major roads, I think that is always a great place to put a sign out as so long as it's their property and you're not breaking any local ordinances. Um, the corner lots, um, the intersections of neighborhood roads. Um, I mean, the best way to explain uh, key placement is to say where not to place it, which, you know, I don't see the value in getting a sign placed at the end of a cul-de-sac. You know, if it's a donor or a volunteer and they want to sign, for sure, give them what they are asking for. But generally, the yard signs are going to be more effective the more people who go by them. And we will talk a bit more about, yeah, roads travel towards schools. If you have houses on roads that go towards schools, that's absolutely a great place to get the yard signs out. And we're going to talk a bit more about some of these uh, campaigning uh, modes in just a second. So yes, door knocking. It is, I wouldn't even say it's one of, I think it's the most impactful way to connect with voters. However, it is also the most time consuming way to interact with voters. So we have to learn efficiency. The first well, a layer of that efficiency comes from your voter lists, comes through your targeting and your list building. If you are targeting high propensity 
voters who are likely to support you, that is a great use of your time. That should be your first bucket always. Second bucket, high propensity voters who may or may not support you, swing voters. Uh, third bucket, low propensity voters who you think are going to support you. There is never a good time to go out and knock on doors that you know they're not going to support you. If they have voted 100% of the time for candidates who do not align with your values, that is not a good use of your time. Uh, but the other way to maximize your efficiency while going door to door is to manage the conversation. And we'll talk more about that in just a second, but you want to be respectful. You want to get as much information as you can, but you also want to do it in a timely fashion. And one important reminder, you are not soliciting. Now, if you see a no soliciting sign on a piece of property, I encourage you to use your best judgment on whether or not to go up there. Uh, in my case, I generally would go up when I was working for campaigns to properties that say no soliciting. Because number one, we are campaigning. It is protected First Amendment speech. So no soliciting signs are not a valid warning. They cannot call the police on you and get them removed from your, their property uh, simply because they had a no soliciting sign on there. However, if it looks like a house that is not going to take very kindly to you walking up, don't do it. Also, if they have extremely specific signs, I kind of weighed that out. Some people will explicitly say no politics. Maybe best not to go and bother that individual. But you are breaking no rules by walking up to a house with a no soliciting sign. No trespassing. Always good to follow that rule, though. All right, so your objectives at the door. Number one, most important, your objective is to gain their support. And in order to do that, you need to be willing to make the ask. You should always, at some point during your interaction, say the words, can I count on your vote whenever the election is? Can I earn your support? I hope I've earned your support. Second, and this is very important for data collection, you want to identify the top concerns of the voters you're speaking to. The best way to do this is when you go up to the door, you know, knock, knock, knock. Hi, my name is Zach. I'm running for Arlington School Board seat number five. And I want to know what you think the school board should be doing that they're not. Or I want to know what your main concerns about the schools are. One, when they start to feed you their answer, uh, if you can retain this information while they're talking, Great, and take your notes later, do that. But maybe it's best to have a phone or a clipboard and you write down simple notes. This will tell you, importantly, the next thing out of your mouth. What I mean by that is when they tell you, oh, you know, I think the school board is spending way too much money. Our taxes are outrageous. They just, you know, redid our property tax estimate went up $5,000 and the schools are getting worse than ever. That's your cue to say, oh, you know, I completely understand. And uh, you're right that the money in our school district is not being spent efficiently. And when I'm on the school board, I will, you know, make sure to spend our money wisely and find savings for taxpayers wherever I can. So not only have they told you what they want to hear, and then you're able to give it back to them so long as it aligns with the values of your campaign. But now you have one more data point saying, oh, you know, people in this community are concerned about the price or concerned about the taxes. You know, education's getting expensive and it's not delivering results. Um, and I kind of preclude, or I kind of previewed this, but the process at the door is to listen, empathize and offer your solutions in that order. When you go through all that, as you're going to walk away, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I'm so glad I met you. Can I count on your vote this November? They say, hopefully, yes. And you say, great. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Go on to the next door. Ideally, this process should take no more than two minutes. 
Um, you're not going, you're not insane if it goes for, you know, three, four or five minutes. If you're consistently at doors for 10 minutes or more, that is a hint that you're not controlling the conversation very well. So you should aim to keep your conversations at the door for under two minutes. Why? Because a 10 minute conversation at one door, if the, one, if they're talking to you for 10 minutes, they're either never going to vote for you or they're absolutely voting for you. So you're not really getting much more for the time investment. That's five houses you could have knocked in the same amount of time that you had one conversation. So when it comes to efficiency, managing the conversation is key. Um, and now, you know, some things not to do when you are going door to door campaigning. One, never show up without resources. This includes your literature, which we'll talk about. Uh, you want a charged phone battery. You want a walkbook, whether that's through one of the data apps or that is a paper walk list that you built using the voter list that you bought or got for free from the county clerk. Um, always know where you're going. Going back to efficiency and what we talked about with lists earlier, it is never a worthwhile strategy to knock every single house in a neighborhood. Some people aren't voters. Some people are never gonna vote for you. Some people aren't citizens. So knowing where you're going before you go out is key, key to being a good door-to-door -door campaigner. Second, don't sound condescending. Uh, work on your tone. You're always going to be upbeat. You're talking to people who are potential voters. Um, don't go right up to the door and out the gate decide to be overly controversial. You know, I know a lot of us are concerned about the curriculum in classrooms. And I know a lot of us are sickened by the way that school boards are treating parents. But going back to what I said before, the first thing you do when you go up to a door is not, hello, my name is Zach Lava and I'm running to get all the dirty critical race theory out of our schools. And I don't want transgender uh, ideology introduced to my kids. You know, you don't know who you're talking to yet. Maybe this is a voter where coming on a bit strong will scare them away. Maybe this is a voter who's not educated on those issues and will think you sound, um, frankly, mean for saying those things, even though we all know that you're simply fighting for classical education and parental rights. Maybe the voter isn't sure of that yet. Maybe they don't know. So, again, that's why we let them tell us what they want from their school board members. Easy one, don't get into arguments. You walk up to the door, you say, my name is Zach Laba, I'm running for school board. First thing out of their mouth is, heck no, I'm supporting you know, the incumbent or I'll never vote for you crazy right wingers. You say, thank you, have a great day and walk away. One, an argument is wasted time. And two, the longer you spend at the door of someone who's not gonna vote for you, the more likely it is they're going to remember to go out and vote against you because now they just don't like you. Uh, dress appropriately when you're going door knocking. Uh, campaign attire is heavily encouraged. Be comfortable. It's going to get warm in the summer. It's going to get a little cooler closer to election day. You don't need to dress in a suit or a, or a fancy uh, uh, woman suit. <laughs> Uh, dress pants, you don't have to do anything like that, but don't dress in any way that could make, you know, anyone go, hmm. Uh, and don't say anything that would come back to haunt you. Whenever you're at the door with a voter, even if it's just one voter, you are in public. They could be recording. They could be, uh, their, their ring doorbell could have you on camera. They could go and tell all of their friends about the crazy thing you said. So, if it's not something you would want in the media, do not say it at a door. Wait, and I saw we have a hand up. Um, yep, patriotic shirts are perfectly appropriate. Just be sure that it is not something overly likely to lean into other political issues. Like if you're running for school board, 
you know, I'm a big second amendment guy. My parents own guns. I have a pistol, but you know what? I'm not going to wear when I'm door knocking for school board, a pro second amendment t-shirt. It's not relevant to the campaign you're running. And there is going to be a sliver of voters who are pro parental rights and education and don't like CRT, but are not big fans of certain levels of gun ownership. You know, those people exist. So patriotic shirts, absolutely. Be careful that it is not wading into other political issues, but American flag, uh, 4th of July, fireworks, um, absolutely appropriate. All right, so talking about literature, these are gonna be your palm cards when you're going door to door. What are the hallmarks of good literature? They're easy to consume. They do not have blocks and blocks of paragraphs of text. You have maybe a paragraph at the top and then the bullet points of your campaign and then vote for me at the bottom, link to your website and your campaign email. And on the back, you have some pictures of you with your family. That's easy to consume. You know, the voter is not going to read a thesis. The less wording you put on there, the more likely they are to read every word of it. So we have to find the balance of getting all the necessary information across without being too verbose. Second, they're going to include relevant issues, especially if they're locally relevant issues. If your school board recently passed a bond to uh, increase, you know, a $10 million take from the tax or $10 million bond sale to fund uh, a new, um, I don't know, diversity, equity, and inclusion training program for new teachers. That's something you might want to put on the literature, put your position on it. Um, the issues that you are highlighting in your campaign should be on every piece of your door-to-door -door literature. And that first paragraph I mentioned should be a personal introduction. Hey there, neighbor. My name is Zach. I'm running to make Arlington County Schools a better place for our parents, our children, and our stakeholders. Here are the main issues of my campaign. Go down the line. Bad literature, and I see people are raising their hands. I will. Uh, please save your questions to the end because we're over halfway through now, and we should have plenty of time for questions. Uh, bad literature is a wall of text. You go into deep political philosophy unnecessarily. Uh, local races, there's no benefit to attacking your opponent personally, even if they are a pig. So don't do it. Um, and nothing that requires additional lengthy explanation should be on your literature. It should be easy to consume. Phone calls and text messages. These are more accessible forms of contact. Uh, almost everyone nowadays has a cell phone, so phone calls and text messages are appropriate. Of course, the downside is they have a lower conversion rate than face-to-face -face voter contact. You are more likely to earn a vote standing in front of someone on their porch than you are by sending them a text or giving them a phone call. However, the data you get from phone calls and text messages is just as valuable as what you would receive at the door. Um, some things to note, uh, you are going to get more rude people over the phone. It is easier people, uh, they've done psychological study after psychological study. It's easy to be rude when you are not directly confronting someone face to face. So expect it, same rules apply if they start being nasty you say, thank you, have a great day and hang up or end the text conversation. Uh, phone calls, if you are able to build a good voter list with phone numbers, uh, very, very easy and effective volunteer work. Volunteers sit at your campaign headquarters or they sit in your home and they make phone calls for two hours. That's a great use of the campaign's time and of the volunteers time. There are tools available. Um, SA group text is a free to use uh, text 
um, service that goes on a cell phone. Downside there is it's going to use your cell phone number to send the texts. So if you have a campaign phone, maybe that's a good way to use it. Um, there are auto dialers like Red Dialer that include text services. And there is one that FreedomWorks uh, and Best uses often, which is Rumble Up. If you have any questions, you can obviously consult their websites or you can email me about questions regarding the pluses or the costs and benefits of using any of these services. But in short, they automate the process, they save you time and your voter lists, you know, if you have them in Excel, can be converted into CSVs and uploaded to these tools. So you will transfer an entire text list in one fell swoop. And then with Rumble Up, you can send them all a text message with just clicking the mouse over and over again. But you can send 3,000 text messages in an hour using these services. Uh, and obviously, these only come into consideration if your budget allows. Do research for an app or a system that would work best for your campaign. Some have very interesting features that would make it much easier for your volunteers. Again, if you ever want advice, please don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, uh, even though they're not the most important part of a grassroots campaign, they're personally my favorite part of every campaign. Events. This when you are not out door to door, when you go through all of your voter contacts and you have some time on a Sunday or on a, you know, an after a school activity or after a football game, you should be hosting an event. Now, events come in different shapes and sizes, but what they all do is connect you with the grassroots. Um, some ideas, hosting intimate meet and greets, uh, you'll get ideas from this for this from your volunteers. Um, so those are events that you host. Uh, they are great ways to meet potential donors, to expand your volunteer base. Um, but besides just campaign events that you host, and we'll go into how to set those up a bit more in a minute, uh, you want to attend as many public events as you can regarding if they don't interfere with your door to door. Um, local club meetings, whether it is, you know, if you're a member of the Elks, you should be going to the Elks. If you have a volunteer who's a member of the Elks, they should be representing you there. Uh, local Republican meetings, uh, local parent group meetings. And then of course your public community events, uh, county fair, church fairs, um, Fourth of July events are a great opportunity to get out in front of the community. Uh, if you have the opportunity to table at any of these events, you should absolutely sign up and get yourself a table. Um, other ideas for events, house parties, whether at your house, a volunteer's house, a donor's house, if they're comfortable with that. Um, those will be smaller events for your volunteers and your donors, and maybe some potential donors. Uh, and of course, rallies, host a rally at the public park, get all of your volunteers to come out and help set up. And then this is a way for you to greet new potential voters, a way for you to get people that you've met at the door. You know, you go out on a Saturday for your super Saturday door knocking event, you find someone who's really enthusiastic about voting for you and then you say, hey, I'm having an event this Monday, right up the road at Woodley Park. You should come and join us. So that's another great way to get your name out there. What do you bring into an event? You're bringing your best energy. You bring a sign up sheet, which can be done a multitude of ways. You bring business cards and palm cards for every potential uh, voter. You bring some campaign gear and some swag. If you have excess t-shirts, maybe give away some t-shirts on a raffle. If you have excess campaign pens and buttons, all of these little things, while not the be all end all of a grassroots campaign are going to make your events or your attendance at an event just that much better. And of course, 
bring signage, bring a banner to put around your table, bring some signs to give away to voters who do not have them already. Keeping in mind you, if you have the signs to give away. Your objectives at an event, similar but different to your objectives at a door. The main idea of an event is to build awareness and name recognition about your campaign. You and your representative should be as easily identifiable as possible. T-shirts, buttons, hats. Uh, you're identifying potential donors and potential volunteers. You know, you have that conversation at the table Someone comes up to you, hey, you know, I saw your campaign. I really like what you're doing. I was on the website. You know, I, I, you have my absolute support. And you say, oh, great. Thank you so much. There's a lot we can do. Uh, would you be willing to come out and volunteer for me uh, later or next weekend? And they say, oh, no, you know, I have a bum hip. I can't volunteer for you. And you say, oh, well, I understand. I hope your hip is doing okay. But, you know, another way you could help out is, you know, every little bit of money counts. I'm really racing hard to take down this incumbent. Um, if you could give me $20, that would really go a long way in helping me get some more literature printed or helping me get some more signs made. Are you willing to do that? Oh yeah, I can donate $20. Perfect. That's one person giving you $20 you wouldn't have had before. And of course, as a side effect, you're gonna be convincing potential voters uh, they will come up and ask questions if they're interested. So always have your talking points ready. Uh, if you're organizing your own event, uh, first thing you want to do, kind of going down the line, is figure out what kind of an event you're hosting. Public events, larger events, these are for the grassroots, for voters, and for volunteers. That's your campaign event at Woodley Park. That's your campaign event at the community center. That's your Q and A type of event. Smaller, more intimate events, you know, your fundraising party at uh, Sandra's house or at your house. Those events are for donors, your key supporters. Volunteers should absolutely, if they're interested, be on hand to help set up and to kind of boost attendance for these smaller events. But this is not something you wanna put out, um, you know, on a mailer or on uh, necessarily the most public part of your campaign website. This is where when someone calls in and says, hey, you know, I have a donor, really wants to meet you in person. You say, oh, great, tell them to come to my house uh, Saturday at 7 p.m. for my donor fundraiser event. Uh, for the more public events, casual works really well, even for donor events as well. Restaurants, pubs, uh, get the back room at a restaurant, you know, a couple hundred bucks may net you a thousand dollars in fundraising if you're in a larger district and people have that kind of money. Uh, parks are great. People can show up wearing their jeans and their polos or their t-shirts. Uh, not everything needs to be a black tie type of event. Um, your Elks Club, your um, local uh, American Legion, if you're a veteran, great place to see if you can host an event there as well. All right, and now you have some homework. First thing, if you haven't done so already, identify groups that would be aligned with your campaign. Second, reach out to your county clerk or your county supervisor of election, or whoever is in charge of the election that you are running in to see about purchasing the public voter lists. Some states make you purchase them. It's usually not an out of, uh, exorbitant fee. Some are available for free if you are a candidate. Um, and third, uh, something Laura talked about when uh, a couple of weeks back, we were marketing uh, your campaign Solidify your top issues. These top issues are not only important for your stump speech, they will be the center of your mailers and your door-to-door -door literature. So with that, I see we had a question. Yes, Sandra, I see your question in the Q&A and I will answer that 
offline, but I can also tell that you have your hand up. So Sandra, what can, uh, what can I explain a bit more? Hi, Zach. Um, I am running, there are three seats available on a five member board in my school district. And so I'm, uh, we're trying to run slate. We're not doing it officially, but I'm campaigning with three other candidates. I'm sorry, two other candidates that are all parents, all Christian conservatives like myself. And I know we have to keep um, fundraising and money separate. My question is on signs. We we wanted to do some signs that say um, PV parents and, you know, have all I, I did a graphic because I, I can do that for all our days, but I was told we always have to put paid for by, you know, Sandra Christensen or paid. If it's three of us, would you recommend maybe starting a pack and say PV parents for whatever PV schools? How, how would we do that? Because I know that we, you know, in, with signs, you have to put somebody's paid for or whatever. It, do you understand? <laughs> I, I do. Yeah. Yep. So for signs, um, obviously you need to keep your fundraising and your expenditures separate because you are running as a slate, not as a single ticket, but there's no limitation on what you do with what you fundraised. So what I would recommend personally is have all three of you and your two compatriots go in on the same design uh, go to the print shop and each of you pay for a certain number split equally and have each one of you. Cause you know, you can say Sandra Christensen, John Doe, right. Jane Doe paid right. for by Sandra Christensen. So we would put all three names rather than open, like making a pack that says PV parents for whatever PV schools. Yeah. Would that the, be most better? the most important part of a yard sign is name ID. Okay. Perfect. Your last name. So it should be Sandra Christensen, Jane Doe, right. John Doe. Yes. Paid for by Sandra Christensen, real small at the bottom. And then the other one will say paid for by Jane Doe, even though it's the same exact sign. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Oh, a CSV is just a, it stands for a comma separated values. It is simply, uh, it's a file on a computer. Um, and when I was speaking about that in relation to the texting apps, what you'll do is you, you have an Excel, you have your list of voters, name, address, phone number, blah, blah, blah you convert it to a CSV, uh, go to the top file, save as, change it on the drop down menu to a CSV. Now you have that CSV made and you upload that to one of the texting apps. Um, that, that's all that is. Not even worth reading. Like as long as you know what's on your Excel, you convert it to a CSV and then upload the CSV real quick and none of the info should be lost. Susan. Yeah, um, obviously they are non-political, uh, but I know Elks Lodges very often allow people to utilize their spaces. So what I would say uh, and I am not a specific expert in the, the Elks. Um, I just bring them up as an example, but obviously they will probably want to ensure that you are not uh, taking this as an endorsement. You are simply using the space. Um, I would approach the subject by reaching out to whoever their events coordinator is. And obviously if your husband's a member, they, he will know that person and just say, hey, can I host a... Uh, can I rent the space to host a campaign meet and greet uh, at the location? Um, and they'll decide to what degree that's acceptable for them. Um, we have in the past, you know, we're obviously not a campaign, but we are a uh, 501c4. We are political. 
we've I've had no problem uh, see, uh, getting responses from uh, Elks chapters and other social clubs uh, to use their event spaces. All right, do we have any more questions? Any comments? Uh, something fun that's been going on in your campaign? Did you have an interesting interaction at the door recently? All right, well, seeing none, I am going to put my email in the chat just to make sure everyone has it. And of course, be on the lookout for the follow-up email for this week's session. I will include the link to our box folder and I will include information on what we're covering next week. Um, some announcements. Uh, Best recently got through our first fly-in of 2022. It was a very exciting event. And I see some people who joined us on the call today. Uh, always feel free to reach out to me if you have potential events you want to host in your local area. Um, and with that, I hope to see you all next week. And do not be afraid to share the registration link for this webinar series. Um, with that, I will follow up with y'all later today. And uh, we're ending five minutes early. So I hope you all have a great day and uh, hope to hear from you soon. Mm -hmm.